Hello and welcome to worship this Sunday, the 2nd of May. Before we begin our worship, a couple of announcements, and the first one's a new one. I'll be talking about it on Facebook and on the webpage as well, but here uh, is new news. In a fortnight, uh, coming up is Christian Aid Week, running from the 10th of May through to the Sunday, the 16th of May, Christian Aid Sunday. The theme of Christian Aid this year is about water and how climate change is making access to clean water all the harder for many folk, many communities across the world. Here in Aberlauer and Craigellachie, we have water, wonderful water, through the River Spey running past our doorstep. I reckon that there's not a single source of water in the world which is exported as widely as water from the Spey through whisky. I've been in rural Malawi, I've been in rural Kenya, and even though the nearest clean drinking water might have been miles away, someone, somewhere, seemed to always have a bottle of Speyside malt sitting on a shelf. So, the invitation is this Christian Aid Week, where we export round the world the water of life, Usqua Bay, that we might also be communities that do something to provide the water necessary for life. So, there are two things. There's a way you can be involved yourself, and that's by uh, deciding to walk any length of the Speyside Way. Um, we're doing this with churches up and down the Spey from Lagan to Spey Bay, um, and you don't have to pick a local stretch, um, but to pick it, to walk it, if you want to do it uh, sponsored, there are sponsor forms available in both churches, or I can get one to you, or to do it just as a fun thing, but also as a reflective prayer walk. There's a prayer resource called the River of Prayer that Christian Aid are putting out this year. And so if on your walk you want to take a printout of this uh, River of Prayer resource, you can go, you can think, you can reflect and be grateful for how fortunate we are to have the water we have and be determined that everyone in the world should have the same access to water. So that's the way you can do it, by picking a chunk of the spay from uh, Lagan to Spey Bay to walk. I, uh, because I'm foolish, have decided that I'm going to do the whole length of the spay in a single day on Saturday the 15th of May. So I'm going to start at Loch Spey, I'm going to run down to roundabout Garva Bridge where I'll get on my bike and cycle Newton Moor, uh, Kingusi, uh, up to Aviemore, Grand Town, along this way, on to Fockabers, all on my bike, about 100 miles. And I'll get off my bike at Fockabers and hop into my kayak and paddle, or more likely just let the water take me down to Spey Bay. 107 miles or 172 kilometres of the Spey in a single day. I'm doing that as a sponsored exercise. If you would like to sponsor me, I'd be delighted you can do that. Um, there are details, again, on the church website, again, on the Facebook page, or uh, on the link that is coming up just now. Um, I'd be delighted if you did that. You can do it in person uh, as well. I'll be bringing uh, the sponsor sheet I've got around with me, but you can do it online or by paper. Um, and I'd be delighted if you could sponsor me for that, but also <laughs> keep me <laughs> in your prayers uh, in the next week or so as I prepare and uh, on the day as well. Um, you'll hear more about it in due course, but that's by way of a new announcement. Of course, we're continuing with the things I announce every week, that our Bible study is on Tuesday, that we have coffee on Wednesday. It's always uh, delightful to see folk at both of those, um, so do keep those in, in mind. This week, we encounter a reading about a good old-fashioned argument in the earliest church. The argument is over what should be demanded over the new believers in the church, the people called Gentiles, who weren't Jews before they believed in Jesus. We're going to see a reading that has debate and dissension mentioned several times, and we'll see how the church comes to make a decision that's based on the fact that God is for everyone. That's the God we worship. 
So let us now come and worship God. Let's pray. Creator God, you made air and water, shape and movement, large and small, fierce and calm, strong and weak. You gave your son who laughed and wept, railed and encouraged, exposed and embraced, new joy and new pain, lived and died. Your spirit moves wild and gentle, solid and fluid, speaking and silent, challenging and affirming, breaking and mending. Lord, too often we are inflexible. We cling to tradition, we resist change. We yearn for securities of the past. We reject risk. We are rooted in routine. So forgive us, Lord, and help us to go and to let go of that which makes us hesitant, fearful, reluctant. May our praise today sing a new song. May our fellowship find harmony in your presence. And when we go from here, May we go holding on to nothing other than your ever-changing, ever-faithful grace and truth. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. Our reading today comes from Acts 15 and verses 1 through 18. Let's listen for the word of God. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets. As it is written, After this I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Amen. A big question. What makes us who we are? What gives us our identity? What gives you yours and me mine? What gives us as a church our identity? It's a big 
existential question. And it's one that our reading today takes us right to the heart of. It takes us to a place where we witness what happens when people who thought they were on the same page about who they are discover deep disagreement about the answer to the question. When we get to the reading that we've just heard, lots has happened between Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch that we had last week and our reading just now. For one thing, a man who was called Saul, who as recently as chapter 9 of Acts was plotting murder against, against the Jesus followers, that man Saul has had his road to Damascus experience. When he did have his conversion, though, the apostles in Jerusalem didn't trust them. He went to them, and very few of them had any time for what he had to say. It seemed too big a change too quickly in this person who'd been previously persecuting them. It was Barnabas who believed Paul, and after a short spell preaching together in Jerusalem, they go to a place called Antioch for a year, where the followers of Jesus, mostly non-Jews there, Gentiles in the language of the Bible, they are called Christians for the first time. That's what we're told in Acts 11. That's Saul, now Paul. Meanwhile, Peter has undergone a reconversion of his own. Peter, Jesus' closest disciple, who had his time with Jesus, heard all Jesus had to teach, yet is still learning. Peter encountered a quandary with a Roman centurion, a man called Cornelius, who invites Peter to eat with him. But the food, because he's a Roman commander, will not be kosher. It will be unclean. It will have been uh, sacrificed to Roman gods and therefore is forbidden to Peter by Jewish laws. Now, Peter has a vision on the flat roof of the midday sun. He's having a nap and his vision causes him to end up going to Cornelius's place anyway. In fact, he's moved to preach to a whole crowd that I really understand now, he says, that to God, every person is the same. In every country, God accepts anyone who worships God and does what is right. These parallel tracks of Peter and of Paul tell the story in Acts of this outward movement of the Holy Spirit, going another stage again out to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. These last few weeks, we've been tracking that movement, first from the Jews in Jerusalem, to the Hellenistic Greek-speaking Jews, to the Ethiopian eunuch, and now to everyone. But Paul and Barnabas have been getting into an argument about what that means for these new Gentile believers. So they are sent up to Jerusalem to sort out the issue because there are some saying that these Gentiles should be circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Now it's not that these Jesus-following Pharisees are necessarily against the idea that the good news is for everyone. They're not small-minded and exclusivist in that sense. It's just, well, to them, surely if God made it this way for us Jews and has done that for all these centuries since Abraham, surely that's how it has to be for these new believers too. I have sympathy for those Pharisees because it's really difficult for us to imagine just how big a deal this is for them. This is a question that does cut right to the heart of their understanding of their religious identity. You see, when the Pharisees talk of circumcision, they don't just mean that ritual surgery performed on Jewish men. When they say circumcision, they mean the whole caboodle of their Jewish identity. They mean their self-understanding as a people God made a covenant with through Abraham. 
that circumcision was the mark of that government covenant, and they themselves are the children of that covenant. When they say circumcision, they mean the whole law and their understanding of being the people that God led out of slavery from Egypt through Moses. They, the people that Moses received the law from God as a sign of the covenant, as a sign of being God's chosen people. So for these Pharisees, the question isn't about whether or not the Gentiles should be a part of God's family, but how that is shown and what demands are placed on the children of God. The idea that Gentiles might be included in the circle of God's love and care, but do so without circumcision in the law, that is a huge change. And it's a change which upturns centuries of self-understanding, of Jewish theology and identity. Which means for us, 2,000 years later, that it's right when we turn to this passage that we don't belittle these Pharisees' views or write them, up, write them off as just being grumpy or cantankerous spoil sports. It's right to acknowledge that change is hard, especially when what you're asked to change feels like it goes to the core of who you are. That's still true today. Change is still hard. It's especially hard when it asks us to change the way it's always been. In, for instance, the Church of Scotland, nationally and in local congregations, we're not known for our love of change. General Assembly after General Assembly over the last 5, 10, 20, in fact 50 years has talked about the need for radical change in how we understand and how we do church. That's not to say there hasn't been any, but we are, for instance, still a long way off the vision of a church without walls. Do you remember that phrase? A church without walls, a vision that was set up, approved, had huge congregational buy-in a mere 20 years ago. I was 10 years old then, and I'm still waiting to belong to a church of Scotland that's a church without walls. Now, one of the reasons I felt called here to Aber Lauer and to Greek Eliki is it does seem to me that the church here does want to be a church community that transcends its walls, the four walls of the building and the walls of our Sunday one hour a week service. But change is hard. Not all resistance to change is about core issues of identity. It's not like it is for these Pharisees. But when change does impinge on any sense of identity, well, that's when the bitter arguments start. That's when we find out, oh, I thought all along we were this sort of people, but you're saying you don't share that. Well, I can't see that's right. In our reading, we heard the words debate and dissension, I think three or four times. The issue, you see, comes when a core aspect of our identity, who we think we are, becomes a barrier for others not being able to share with us. The issue isn't that we have a sense of our own identity, but when that sense of identity becomes an in or an out issue, where we either exclude others from joining us, keeping them out, or when we let folk in, we exclude ourselves, we leave or keep our distance. Issues of identity can't be in or out. Because the church, certainly in terms of human judgment, simply cannot afford to have in or out markers of identity. Peter said, I really understand now that to God every person is the same. 
Peter said, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter was saying that no one can draw an in or an outline for God. Because none of us can do anything to earn God's favor. God loves us by God's free grace. By God's free grace, we are made God's children. Anything that seeks to control or put conditions or mark out a safe, human approved arena for God's grace is idolatry. Peter calls it that. He says it's an attempt to test God. So in our reading, I think it's fair that the Pharisees can and perhaps should continue in their ways, in their inherited forms of ritual observance. Jesus did it, after all, Peter and Paul prefer to, all of them Jews keeping the law. In Paul's letters, though, it's a repeated theme of when to keep the law, when not to. And if you go through Paul's letters, the key theme is always If keeping the law becomes a stumbling block to new believers, then you have to let it go. We each have things that make us who we are. The markers of our personal identity, but also the markers of our congregational identity, our denominational identity. A strong sense of our own identity is a good thing because it helps us live authentically. It helps us know who we are and live and act with integrity to that. It's good to have a sense of identity, but our identity can't ever be a stumbling block for others. So let's be people. Let's be a church that celebrates our identity, that rejoices in it, and invites others to come and share in the riches and the joy of God's grace, which is broad enough for everyone. Amen. The church is wherever God's people are praising Knowing they're wanted and loved by their Lord. The church is wherever Christ's followers are trying to live and to share out the good news of God. The church is wherever God's people are loving, where all are forgiven start once again where all are accepted whatever their background whatever their past and whatever their pain the church is wherever god's people are seeking to reach out and touch folk wherever they To challenge, refresh, and excite, and inspire. The church is wherever God's people are praising, knowing they're wanted and loved by our Lord. The church is where we, as Christ's followers, are trying to live and to share. The good news of God. Let's pray. God of grace, hear us as now we bring to you our prayers for the world, for our nation, for our church, for ourselves. We think of our world, that there are so many places where There is more cause for grief and sorrow than for joy. Places where life is lived far less abundantly than you designed it to be. 
help us to do all that we can for the good of humanity. We hear, even as in this country we're coming out of COVID-19, how great a toll it continues to take around the world. We pray for the country of India and those struggling there for lack of oxygen, for medical supplies, for the necessities of basic hygiene. All around the world, people are struggling. We pray, may the strong nations of the world help the weak. May the rich nations of the world share what they have with the poor. God, bring peace to our troubled planet. Bring an end to the divisions which lead to hatred. And may, through you, the world be united and learning to live in peace. God, we pray for our nation. As we head to the polls this week, we thank you that we live in a country in which these determinations can be made peacefully in a democracy. A country in which the will of the people is asked. This week we hold before you all who seek election in Holyrood. We pray for wisdom, for graciousness, and above all for a desire and a passion and the hard work which will see our communities flourish. We pray for all those involved in the election, counters, campaigners, voters and electors. Give wisdom, integrity and discernment. Lord, we pray for our church. We ask your blessing on the church as it seeks to proclaim your gospel that in God everyone is equal, that all find their home in your love. In an age which values scepticism and valorises uncertain doubt, we pray that the church might preserve a space where faith and hope are held above cynicism. We pray for our church in Aberlour and Craigelke and for all those it seeks to serve. May we as a congregation be a beacon of your light. Grant us strength in working with churches across the area to show your love for the world, empowered by the strength of Christ. And God, we pray for ourselves. You care for all and no one is beyond the reach of your help. Help all of us who are in difficulties today, the sick and the suffering, the anxious and the anguished, the fearful and the frightened, the guilty and the grieving, the distressed and the dying. May the knowledge of Christ's re resurrection be a light to all who are going through their own personal time of trial. May your peace be with all who are in need. And God, you know the desires of our own hearts, and we feel the need of your love. So as we pray, we claim for ourselves your promise of life and life in abundance. Help us neither to doubt your love nor to judge ourselves, but instead to know ourselves as loved by you, cherished and called by name. Almighty God, you hold all souls in life. Your life sustains all that is. Bring your creation to fullness and hear our prayers. In the name of the resurrected Christ. Amen. We believe, Peter said, that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now go, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and evermore. Amen.